It's so easy to get enamored by the things of this world that we forget about heaven. Hello and welcome to Tony Broom Ministries, presenting the old-time teaching and preaching from God's Word. Here's a sermon entitled, Hankering for Heaven. Brother Dwight L. Moody said, Lord, if you don't stop blessing me, I don't know what I'm going to do. You're just going to have to hold back your hand. I said, well, that's probably why he got that blessing and not me, because he'd have to burn me a brand new one before I'd have told him to hold back. Well, he's still working on me. Thank God that he's a patient, a loving Heavenly Father. You ever been sitting in front of the TV or your living room in the chair and all of a sudden you had a hankering for something? You might have a hankering for that chocolate ice cream, apple pie, cherry pie, or something you know you really shouldn't have, but you want it anyway. They have these advertisements that come on all the time. They tell you what kind of biscuits on sale. Want to get a, need to go have a, you know what, kind of biscuit. They'll tell you what's on sale. They want you to get up in there right then and go get one because you have a hankering for it. Now, young folks wouldn't understand the word hankering, but you old timers, you know what that's all about. You used to have a hankering for a RC and a moon pie. <laughs> Can't find either one anymore. We got some moon pies at home, but they just don't taste the same. Maybe it's because my tasters done had 50 years plus of tasting moon pies. And they just don't taste the same. Hankering. A strong desire or longing for something. Is our stay in this world causing our hankering to be replaced with hesitancy? There was a time when we had a strong hankering, a desire, a longing for heaven. But it's because of this world that we're living in, is that being replaced with hesitancy? Are we more hesitant now about going to heaven than we used to be? We used to have a longing. We used to have a hankering, a desire to go to heaven. In Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 21, the Apostle Paul says, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We have it made either way. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He could not lose. You cannot lose with the stuff I use. He could not lose either way. We have it made either way. If we stay here, we're blessed. If we leave and go with the Lord, we're more blessed. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. In other words, I'm just getting what's coming to me in the natural. If I live in the flesh and my life is all about the flesh and my career and my family and my kids and my grandkids and what kind of inheritance I have and what kind of money I have and what kind of car I have, what kind of house I have, what kind of goods I have laid up. If that's all this all about, then that's the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I what not. In other words, I don't know which to choose. To live is Christ. If you live for Him as Christ, it's good, and even to die is gain. But I really don't know which one to choose. I have a pulling in both ways. I am in a straight. David said he was in a straight one time, didn't he? He had <laughs> choose which one of these things I'm going to do to you. You want the sword of your enemies? You want the pestilence of the Lord? He gave him three choices. He just said, I don't know what to do. I'm in a great strait. The apostle here said, I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. That is the best. We would say that's the bestest. To depart and to be with Christ is far better. Now that statement I just made, to depart and to be with Christ is far better. Now we hear that and we assent that we accept it as true, but if you don't really believe that, there's a problem that needs to be fixed with the screwdriver out of your spiritual toolbox. 
If you don't believe that to depart and to be with Christ is far better, then there's a problem. If this world has so much magnetism, and the Holy Spirit in prayer last evening, Pastor Ronnie can bear me witness of this, he bore witness, two or three of us, as we prayed that the magnetism of this world would be taken off for the people that are so strongly drawn to this world. And it draws them so tightly that as the sister said this morning, they know what they ought to do. They know that they ought to give their life to the Lord. But the magnetism of this world is drawing them so tightly that they can't hardly get away from it. To depart and be with Christ is far better. I can tell you without any reservation, brothers and sisters, that to depart and be with Christ is far better than this trash can that we're living in. It's far better than what's going on on Capitol Hill. It's far better than what's going on at the joke of the southern border. It's far better than the wars that's going on in Ukraine and across the world. To depart and be with Christ is far better than this junk that's going on down here. I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. But, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Those are the two things that he was faced with. The one that he knew which was best, to depart and be with Christ. And all our troubles, all our trials will then be over. That's the best. But to abide in the flesh, he said, is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance of joy of faith. Having this confidence, I don't chase rabbits but I do camp out on that word just a little bit. Having this confidence. We need confidence to be able to say for sure that Jesus Christ is my Savior and my Lord. Not just because a preacher said so. Not just because somebody told me that I got sanctified. Yeah, but what do you say about it? Do you believe you got sanctified? Do you believe you got saved? Do you believe you got the baptism of the Spirit? Not because of what the bishop said. Not because of what the pastor said. Not because of what a class teacher said. Are you confident? Do you have that confidence? And he said, I have confidence. There's a song written about it. I have confidence. God's going to see me through. No matter what the case may be, I know that He'll fix it for me. We have confidence. We have to have confidence. In this time that we're living in, there's so much think so, maybe so, hope so, second guessing. You may second guess what might be on sale at the store. But you better not second guess things about heaven. You better know for sure when you're talking about heaven. You better know for sure when you lay down right, because then you can get up right. If you don't lay down right, you can't get up right. If you lay down wrong, you're going to get up wrong. Having this confidence. He had to have confidence because what he really wanted to do was depart and go on and be with Jesus. That's what he really wanted to do. But he had to have confidence that it was God that was telling him to wait just a little longer. Having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all. Paul was a southerner, you all. To continue with you all for your furtherance of joy and faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. I have this confidence that I will abide with you. And they were glad about that. Paul was glad about the first part. He really wanted to go and be with the Lord. But when he told the people, he said, I am going to abide and continue with you. They were glad about that. By my faith and by my rejoicing, you have a continuance and furtherance of your joy and faith that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. 
All they were concerned about is, when's he coming? When's he coming? When's he coming? It's like your five-year-old grandkid. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? They were just concerned about when is he coming back? Some of them thought, Jimmy Mack, he ain't never coming back. But Paul said, I am coming back. God has assured me that I will stay and abide with you so that you can be helped. Paul was willing to stay here if that would help the body of Christ. This thing about heaven, having a hankering for heaven, he had a strong hankering for heaven. He wanted to go, but he was willing to stay if that would help the body of Christ. You're talking about sacrifice. You're talking about total commitment. I don't know if you've thought about this lately or not, but the Apostle Paul, he was modest. He didn't call his own name, but he was talking about himself in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he says that he, this certain man, he was talking about himself, was caught up to the third heaven where he saw things and he heard words that were unlawful to utter, so holy, so outstanding. He said, I would tell you about it, but I can't. I'm not allowed to tell the things that happened. I'm not allowed to tell the things that I saw. It's amazing how these people write these books about these out-of-body experiences. And the first thing they do when they get out, they want to, when they come back, so-called come back, they want to write a book and see how many copies they can sell. wonder why the Apostle Paul didn't do that. He was not allowed to tell these things was even given a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to keep him humble so that he wouldn't get too high and mighty because of the abundance of the revelations. That's where I really want to go. Can you imagine ever having seen heaven and not having a desire to go there? You just want to stay down here and play around a little bit? Just go ahead and play a little, another course of golf. Go ahead and go fishing. Go ahead and go to Roses and see what's on sale. Fooey Dewey on all that. He had seen the third heaven where God was. He didn't care about this stuff anymore. The treasure that is laid up in this world. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. The only big problem, one big problem about having earthly treasure is you're always worried about it. There's something always can happen to it. Either it gets old and tarnished and something happens to it and decay. You have to go through money and you have to go through all these things to keep it up. Or either it can be stolen and taken away from you. Did you see the big diamond that they found? This huge, gigantic diamond that they found I forget how many carats the thing was. It was a huge thing that they found. Talked about how many millions and billions of dollars that it was worth. And I told Miss Peggy, I said, My Lord, if I had the thing, I'd be worried somebody else would cut my arm off to get the thing or something would happen to it. Right. Why well, have something that you can go out every once in a while and take a peek at it and say, Peeky, peeky, poo, poo, here's my diamond. You're so scared the wrong one's going to see it. Let me take a look at that thing. Hmm, what's this address here? 366 North Main Street. I'll be back directly. <laughs> Nighttime comes, I'll bring my brother with me. Maybe I don't bring my brother with me because he might want to get in on the deal too. I'll bring somebody else I don't know. Anyway, you're always worried about something happening to it. Moth and rust corrupts it. Thieves break through and steal. Lay up for yourself treasure in heaven. You don't have to worry about anything happening to it. You don't have to worry about thieves breaking through or stealing. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your treasure is laid up in the bank, that's where your heart's going to be. You might have a profession of faith. You might claim to be sanctified. You may speak in tongues to make yourself feel a little bit better about the situation. But if your treasure is stocked up in this world, that's where your heart is going to be. If your treasure is laid up in heaven, that's where your heart is going to be. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. 
The Apostle Paul didn't have much treasure in this world. He could have had everything. But he said, I lost it all. It became like dung for the cause of Christ. I count all things but dung that I may win the excellency of Christ. And he said, I've suffered the loss of all things. He had friends. He had the priesthood. He had the Sanhedrin. He had everybody on his side. It's amazing when you serve the devil, you got all these people on your side. Sometimes when you serve God, you don't feel like nobody's on your side. But really they are. All the saints of God should be on your side because you're on the right side. Amen. You done got off the left side and come to the right side. That's why for Christians, it's not a hard choice to vote. It's not a hard choice. There ain't but one choice. You may not have much of one, but it's not but one choice. That's the right choice. Paul knew what was important to him. The saints in the book of Hebrews were anxious for the heavenly country. They certainly didn't have a lot of this world's goods to hold them back or keep them here. They desired a heavenly country, the Bible says. They wanted that heavenly city. There was a time in the church when the saints, when they would sing, it is well, it is well with my soul, and they would shout and praise God. They didn't need to be pumped up. They didn't need to be cranked up. They were already excited about heaven. We can sing about give me that old time religion. It doesn't touch us like it used to. When we sing about I'll fly away, we look around and say, well, maybe I'll stay another day. We sing about when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. That used to excite the saints of God. But now we drudge through the old hymns. Like our favorite soft drink is 7-Up. We got a stuck, stick stuck 7-Up. Inches up there. There used to be a time in the church where the saints of God were excited about heaven. They had never seen heaven like the Apostle Paul had, but they were excited about going there. They were, as Adrian Rogers said, they were just as good as heaven as if they were already there. Tragedy, troubles, trials. The easier one has it in this life, the less one tends to have a hankering for heaven. Maybe we've had it too easy. Now God wants you to have it easy. He don't want you to have it hard. But the enemy is the one who makes it hard for you. But even though God doesn't want you to have a hard time, the easier that we have it, just like Israel, God said, beware, when you get in the promised land, things start happening. You start getting full. You start getting fat. You start getting ease in Zion. You start getting relaxed. Beware, lest you forget the Lord your God. Seems like the more that we're blessed, we ought to remember God, but it goes the other way. Seems like the more that we are blessed, the more that we have, the less that we rely on God. And the easier that we have it in this life, the less of a hankering for heaven we seem to have. We get so caught up with living that we become careless about dying. When we're having a hard time and the heat is really on, somehow, suddenly, we find ourselves crying and longing for heaven. Oh God, just take me on. Why don't we say that when things are going easy? When things are moving groovy? We're not so excited about it. We want to stay down here because things are going good. Notice how our longing is not nearly so deep when we have a pocket full of money, the birds are sweetly singing, and nobody is bothering us. Nobody's bothering me. Nobody's giving me a hard time. I'm having it pretty well on easy street. I'm not so hankering for heaven. But when I start having a hard time, somehow... I get real spiritual and I get ready to go home. The old prophets who prayed to God that He would take their life in death. Jonah did. Jeremiah did. A lot of the prophets did. The old prophets who prayed to God that He would take their life in death only did so when they thought someone else was about to do it. Ask Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19 if you don't believe it. That mighty victory on Mount Carmel. 
Don't halt anymore between two opinions. If Baal is God, follow him. If God is God, follow him. Fire comes down from heaven. Consumes the sacrifice. The altar, the trench, everything. Prophets of Baal are killed. He has a victory. Then one little old bony woman gets a hold to it. And she said, let the gods do so to me if I make not your life like one of them by tomorrow this time. And he runs and flees for his life. And he says, that's enough, Lord. You can just take away my life now. Why didn't he do that on the victory of Mount Carmel? Why did he wait and run from just one little old woman? Then he wanted God to take him on. Truth. Are we as excited about seeing Jesus and our loved ones as we might be about a big tax refund? What about a little tax refund? I don't know if they're sending it all to Kuwait. I don't know if they're sending it all to Ukraine. I don't know what they're doing. Ain't nobody got none yet for it, I know. They're keeping it. Maybe they're printing money at night and need to cover it with it. I don't know what's happening. Free food or a senior discount? I got some free food. I got a senior discount. I saved 25 cents. Can you believe it? Senior discount. I burned that $15 worth of gas to go across town to get that 15 cent discount. Lord, help my sanctified soul. We're going to be excited about some frivolous thing like that, yet we're not excited about going to heaven. The latest, greatest fashion item, including that hoochie goochie pocketbook, or that package on our doorstep. I got that order. Been expecting it a long time. I had to pay $17.50 to get it shipped to me, but I'm still excited about it. That package that comes to our doorstep. You open it up, plug it in, don't even work. You ain't got to be bothered about how to get it back. That vacation getaway. V-A-C-A-T-I-O-N in the summertime. Everybody needs a little getaway, but are we excited? What about that big vacation? When you get away and ain't never coming back. Woo! That's something to be excited about. When you have a vacation on this world, I never thought about it since I became an adult, I do. We used to go to the beach. Wait, time out. Pentecostals, coast. Okay. Coast. We used to go to the coast and take a towel and lay it on the sand. I know. Mm, cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. <laughs> lay the towel on the sand and lay down on top of the towel on the sand. Don't you get no dirt on me. <laughs> Ain't nothing but ram with 50, 100 miles but dirt. Sand. And we're going to be excited about that. What about that? I can't wait to visit with the children or grandkids. Boy, I can't wait till they get here. Boy, I can't wait till they go home. <laughs> Are we as excited about seeing Jesus and our loved ones? Dull. I didn't say duh. I knew, duh. I said dull. We get dull sometimes. <laughs> I told Brother Vernie this morning, we're trying to hit some of them keys. I said, man, these things are stiff as a board this morning. Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm getting stiff as a board. I don't know. But I thought about it in this message about heaven. Are our keys to getting ready to heaven, they done got stiff on us? Do they need to be played and jangled a little bit? We are told the truth about heaven in Revelation chapters 21 and 22. It's a beautiful four-square city with walls of jasper, gates of pearl, and streets of gold. I was thinking about it this morning, lying in the bed before I even got up. I was thinking about this message, and me and the Lord came to this conclusion, that I know more about heaven, I've never been there, 
I've never seen it like the Apostle Paul did before time. Never been there. I've never seen it, but I know more about heaven than I do about the place. And we've been living in the same place for over 28 years. Now, I can get around my place quite well, and I know where things are. But I don't know the dimensions of my place. But I do know the dimensions of heaven. I don't know all the materials that my place is made of, but I know what heaven is made of. We are even given the dimensions of the heavenly New Jerusalem and are told of what materials it is made with. We're told about the wall. We're told about the stones. We're told about the foundations. We're told about the streets, as I said, streets of gold, walls of jasper, gates of pearl. We are described in that heavenly city where we're going, and yet we act like we don't know anything about it. Therefore, we're not excited about it. We are told about the throne of God, this fantastic throne. There's no other like it in the whole universe. From this throne, He rules in power and glory even now, even though His kingdom, the fruition of it, hasn't been set in yet. He still is in control. He rules. The psalmist said He rules heaven and earth from His throne. Holiness is the habitation of your throne, the habitation of your house forever. We are told about the throne of God, the river of water of life, this river of water of life that proceeds out of the throne of God, the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God, the activities that are going on now in heaven. And they're going on day and night, night and day. There's no night there, but just for our understanding all the time, including the praise and worship of the angels to God and the rejoicing of the saints. You want to know what's going on in heaven? That's what's going on in heaven all the time. You don't even crack chapter 4 of the book of the Revelation and he tells John to come up here, which represents the rapture of the church. You don't even crack that until you get in on a worship scene like you've never seen in heaven. The angels of God are rejoicing around the throne. The four and twenty elders fall down from their seats and they praise God. And the four living creatures worship God and the saints worship and praise God. The central focus of heaven is the Lamb of God on the throne, the glorified Christ of glory. Being with the one who died for us and rose again is certainly enough to give us a hankering for heaven. I hope today that your desire for heaven has increased, that it has been rekindled once again, that we have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better if it's needful that we stay here to help someone, to pray for the sick, to bless the poor, to bless the body of Christ, so be it. But it's far better to depart and to be with Christ. Amen. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You know, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. But really, when you think about it, there's not even many people talking about heaven. I'd rather talk about it. Even if you don't go, I'd rather talk about it than not even talk about it at all. It's so easy to get our focus, even in the church, earthly, and I know the Holy Spirit and the Great Commission and all that, earthly ministry, ministry on this world. You got preachers, they don't want to go to heaven right now. They got too big of a salary coming from the church. I'm going to preach the truth. It don't matter. They got too much money in the bank. They got the boat down at the dock. They're not sitting at the dock at the bay. They're waiting on get on the dock on the boat to get in the bay. It's too much stock in this world. They're worried about what the stock is going to be like. S&D and all the levels and all the marketings. And they watch the stock board. They watch the stock gate. If we would be concerned about lost souls like we are about what the gold is worth, what the silver is worth, what the stocks are going to do, what the market's going to do, what the economy is going to do. We've got to get our sights. And he tells us, lay not up for yourselves treasure, but he also says your life is hid with Christ in God. Let us not focus 
on things down here. Let us set our eyes on things above where our life is hid with Christ in God to be more excited about heaven. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be in this place today. Thank you for your people. Lord, I know that we have people here. I know we have people online. We have people that love God and serve God. And the burdens of this life have gotten them down, but it's not got them out. And they're still excited about Jesus. They're still excited about heaven. And I thank you for that, Lord. And I pray that our sons, our daughters, our grandchildren, people that we don't even know, that don't even think about heaven, God, I pray that you'd finger around their heart today and wake them up in their understanding and their minds. Help them to come alive to the things of God. Help them to be saved and get ready for heaven. Help us all to get ready for heaven because, Jesus, you could come at any moment. We bless you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This has been the Old Time Preaching from God's Word a sermon entitled Hankering for Heaven. Make sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior and you know Him as your Lord today. This has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries.